now we are, it's our time for our uh, third lecture. Last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Adil Ahmed Hussein. He is Director of Critical Care Administration in uh, King uh, Abdullah Medical City, Holy Capital KSA. And his lecture today is about um, arrhythmia, diagnosis and treatment, uh, specifically bridge arrhythmia. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Adil. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Hada. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashfa al-qidlaa al-mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira. I have to thank the organizing committee for this wonderful webinar and giving me this opportunity tonight to be with you for giving my presentation today. Uh, so uh, I will go through my presentation, uh, which uh, is titled The Brady Arrhythmias for the Intensivist. Uh, and I, I have nothing to disclose tonight with, in my lecture. Uh, if you remember, uh, the series uh, lecture and outline for the arrhythmia uh, for the intensivist, uh, we uh, divided or we uh, classified into uh, five lectures. Uh, lecture number one, already we gave it uh, two weeks ago, which was the arrhythmia overview. Uh, our meeting tonight and our appointment tonight will be lecture number two, which is the Brady arrhythmia differentiation and uh, management. So the, the structure and outline overview for uh, my lecture tonight, uh, number one, uh, I will go through a very important question. Usually we ask ourselves uh, every time we face a pradi arrhythmia in uh, ICU settings. Why pradycardia is, is, dang is dangerous? So uh, I, we will highlight the phys physiological review. Number two, the causes or the common causes of pradi arrhythmia in ICU. Number three, uh, the evaluation and the clinical approach to, for a patient with bradyarrhythmia in ICU. Number four, the resuscitative overview, either medical uh, resuscitation arm or electrical resuscitation arm. And I will uh, sum up with a few take home messages. Why bradycardia is, is, is dangerous? Uh, if, if we remember the, the, the equation from uh, uh, the physiology, uh, how the cardiac output can be uh, affected by the heart rate and the stroke volume. So for a pradycardia, let's say here the cardiac output equals the heart rate and the stroke volume. So the, if I have a pradycardia, or so-called moderate bradycardia that will lead to decrease in the cardiac output, the only compensation now will be the increase in the stroke volume. If the bradycardia is more severe, and consequently the cardiac output will drop more, again, I left or we left with the only compensatory uh, mechanism, which is the the stroke volume, but for certain limit, as Dr. Walid showed us nicely in his uh, uh, lecture, how the stroke volume can be traced uh, with the point of care ultrasound. So for a simple mathematical relationship, uh, we can delineate that the effect of pradycardia on the cardiac output is often underestimated. Pradycardia directly, as we mentioned, pull down the cardiac output. Potentially, it will cause shock, of course. So slowing down the heart rate may cause minimal decrease in the diastolic filling. This is from physiology. And this is, you can see it clearly on, uh, when you assess the, the, the echo or you assess the diastolic filling with the point of care ultrasound. So with bradycardia, there is a minimal increase. There is a time for the diastolic filling. And this is will uh, allow for increasing the stroke volume. However, this compensatory mechanism, which is the increasing the uh, stroke volume, is still weak and is extremely limited. 
based on the cardiac function, the ejection fraction, the restrictive pattern. So those com you cannot rely most of the time on the compensatory mechanism of increasing stool volume. For example, if you, the heart rate decreases for, by a factor of two, we will not find the stroke volume double facing the, uh, the heart rate uh, decrease or the pradycardia to compensate for this. So there is no um, proper matching between the stroke volume rise to compensate for uh, decrease in the heart rate. In severe pradycardia, the, for sure, as I, I showed you in the previous slide, the cardiac output will be low. And this is, uh, as we uh, say it, in uh, the, the, the relationship between the cardiac output, blood pressure, uh, stroke volume, heart rate. Some patients can compensate for, for, for uh, uh, low cardiac output without developing shock. We say it a lot. However, we're uh, increasing severe pradycardia, there should be an increased concern about the cardiogenic shock. So we mentioned it before, when you have severe pradycardia, uh, heart rate, for example, 20s, 30s, so think about uh, cardiogenic shock, even if the patient had the compensation still, or the compensatory mechanism with the vasoconstrictor uh, effect related to the, drive, the, the, the sympathetic drive, can maintain a cardiac output, it will uh, compensate uh, slowly or uh, mildly to uh, maintain the cardiac output. And actually, the cardiac output will be, will be low. So you should not fall by uh, a normal uh, blood pressure with bradycardia or with severe bradycardia. So, this is uh, the, the equation of uh, the three variables, which is the blood pressure equals the cardiac output multiplied by the SVR, systemic vascular resistance. So when there is a drop of the cardiac output, which is the heart rate multiplied by stroke volume, there is a compensatory mechanism from the sympathetic drive, which is, uh, it will increase the systemic vascular resistance resistance, so you, this is, will result in maintaining an overall pressure. But on the other hand, look, if you have a, an echo or you have an invasive monitoring to measure the cardiac output, you will find definitely the cardiac output is low, though the blood pressure is still maintained. When you have a bradycardia without vasoconstrictor response, here you lost the systemic vascular response or the systemic vascular resistance, here, uh, it's still uh, not increased still with the normal, but the cardiac output here uh, dropped because of the bradycardia and low stroke volume, for sure, the, the proper pressure will be low. Type. Now, look for bradycardia with excessive sympathomimetic response, which uh, were applied when you have the shock and you are applying vasopressors or catecholamines, means it will increase the systemic vascular resistance tremendously to maintain the, the map or the blood pressure, but this is, will be on the expenses of the cardiac output or the low cardiac output. So you should not be happy just with maintaining blood pressure or maintaining systemic vascular resistance without looking for what's going on with the, your cardiac output. So frequently we have uh, this statement from our fellows or our residents when he uh, wants to discharge patient from ICU or he is assessing patient in the floor. The, the heart rate is 40, but the blood pressure is fine. I think we can send this patient to the floor. So now he is relying on a heart rate of 40. Yes, patient is bradycardic, for example, sinus bradycardy. And he looked for the blood pressure, but the blood pressure is still maintained. So for this statement, I should dissect it before discharging the patient to the floor. Because some patient with bradycardia, when, as I showed you, that would maintain blood pressure due to the endogenous sympathetic response that caused vasoconstriction. Despite normal blood pressure, those patients still having a low cardiac output and still be in shock. Rare patient can present with severe bradycardia and severe hypertension because of the severe vasoconstrictive uh, response. 
Hypertension usually is caused by massive sympathetic storm or massive sympathetic response and the body struggles to compensate for the bradycardia. So he has to go for another compensatory mechanism, which is the systemic vascular resistance. But this is, a, a, we have to take care because this mechanism or this situation is dangerous and should be managed uh, uh, appropriately because the sympathetic response is the one who's actually keeping the patient alive. And if you remember, if you are planning to intubate this patient, for example, and you start to sedate him, once you abolish the sympathetic drive, this patient, he may go into a, a, a frank shock. So aggressive vasodilatation to treat the hypertensive emergency will cause hemodynamic collapse, of course. So the management usually should focus on correction of the bradycardia because this is one of the main elements that will abolish this hemodynamic collapse. Once the heart rate normalizes, so the endogenous catecholamines or the endogenous sympathetic response, of course, should relax and everything will resolve. So for, for bradycardia, when you have severe bradycardia or progressive bradycardia, let's say progressive bradycardia, sometimes uh, it's, it's a harbinger of death. What does it mean? It's an, an, an red flag for, uh, we call it very arrested bradycardia. So for example here, for, for this tracing, I have a patient was having chest pain, then start to be diaphoretic and hypotensive, then uh, some of the residents, he start to give him some atropine. And uh, despite the atropine, the patient continue to have this severe peri-arrest uh, pradycardia. So the progressively worsening pradycardia is often seen immediately preceding this. We call it a brading down or uh, a dying rhythm or eminent death or peri-arrest uh, uh, peri rhythm. If the patient's heart rate is consistently dropping in front of your eyes, so do not just stand there, and immediately you have to get some pharmacologic uh, intervention or electrical intervention, whatever uh, uh, you are familiar with or whatever is available in your hands. And uh, for example, here, uh, I, I, I will not rely only on atropine, I will give the epinephrine here as fast as possible, and I will show you later why. The differential diagnosis of pradycardia here should be broader than usual. Uh, for example, if the patient now is an MI or tamponading, uh, so you, you, you should prod why you, the, your patient is, is having this progressive pradycardia. And this is uh, should include such entities that uh, uh, associated with severe hypoxemic respiratory failure or severe RV failure uh, uh, for, from, uh, for example, massive PE. Immediate evaluation should focus on, of course, each time you face this, the, the, the immediate evaluation should be focused on the EBCs, airway breathing and circulation, uh, using also your bedside echo, as Dr. Walid said in his uh, 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 percentage. So uh, one more reason also for, for, for fear pradycardia or PLS pradycardia is the Tursat de Poix. Uh, uh, those tourism are lethal rhythm. This is one of the uh, examples for the polymorphic VT or what they call it Tursat de Poix. And uh, this is, uh, or this rhythm is, is one of the rhythms that we see it frequently in the ICU. Uh, for uh, many predisposing factors like myocardial ischemia or lung QTC. So you should be aware about the Trousseau de Poin uh, if the patient is bradycardic because in, uh, in some entities of patients, the Trousseau de Poin is a pose dependent. What does it pose? It's like the systolic, isystolic pose or long pose. So there is one entity of the Tursat is a pose dependent. So if you have one patient with bradycardia and ICU and with frequent poses, be careful uh, that, patient, that this patient may develop uh, Tursat de uh, Furthermore, the bradycardia itself, as we mentioned, also it prolonged the QTC. It is possible that leaving patient in severe bradycardia may increase the risk 
of after set. So you should correct it as soon as possible, especially if the bradycardia is progressive uh, or severe. Now, moving to the uh, second part, which is the what are the common causes of pradyarrhythmia in ICU? Just I will highlight it under uh, 3M, 1N, infection, uh, then others. So for M, it's the medication or intoxication. And of course, beta blockade calcium channel blockade toxicity, clonidine toxicity, the Jackson toxicity, uh, propofol infusion syndrome, uh, those common uh, medications, overdose, that cause lethal bradyarrhythmia in ICU. What about the metabolic cause? One of the common causes is the Prash syndrome. Uh, what's the Prash syndrome? This is a syndrome associated with hyperkalemia, renal failure, AEV block. Usually patient with renal failure and hyperkalemia, they go into what they call it Prash syndrome. So most commonly the severe hyperkalemia, if it's, especially if it's acute, hypermagnesemia, hypo, hypothyroidism, hypoglycemia if severe, yes, and also severe hypoxemia can cause, of course, uh, a bradyarrhythmia. Uh, arrhythmia. What about the uh, N? Those are the three Ms. What about the N? N usually it's it's related to neurological catastrophe that, that, that can cause bradycardia. Number one is the, uh, we know it uh, from, from people who are working, especially in uh, neurocritical care or neuro ICUs, the Cushing reflex from high ICP, traumatic brain injury, intracerebral bleed. So patient, when he have high ICP, he presents with hypertension, then bradycardia, then think about the Cushing reflex because of the high ICP and, and imminent uh, herniation or conization. Of course, the neurogenic shock uh, can lead to severe uh, bradycardia and, or bradyarrhythmia that can also lead to the so-called giant wave syndrome and associated with uh, uh, long QT torsatibor. Uh, what about infections? Yes, uh, aortic valve endocarditis, aortic valve abscess, it causes conduction abnormality and uh, heart block. Uh, cephalus, uh, Lyme disease, also one of the common infections. Maybe we are not seeing a lot of cephalus now, but in the past there was associated with uh, severe bradycardia. The senile degeneration or of the sinus nodes, uh, as we mentioned, the calcific uh, aortic valve or calcific sinus node can cause either a sick sinus or a EV block. Uh, here is the, uh, what I mentioned before is the Prash syndrome. So Prash syndrome is just like five letters. P for bradycardia, R for renal failure, A for EV block, S for shock, H for hyperkalemia. So actually this Prash syndrome is an overlap between the hyperkalemia, the severe hyperkalemia, and the medication that can cause the AV node a block. So this overlap will result in the Prash syndrome. So, and we have a vicious circle, especially a renal failure. So if you have a renal failure, either drug induced or uh, AKI, so, for example, if we will have ACE inhibitor or ARBs uh, that induce uh, uh, AKI or renal failure, then I have uh, renally cleared beta blockade or calcium channel blockade with renal failure. So, if the patient is an ACE inhibitor or beta blocker, so uh, it will be not uh, uh, adequately cleared because of the renal failure. So, the renal failure will cause hyperkalemia. The hyperkalemia will cause bradycardia, of course, and the bradycardia will cause a hypoperfusion. The hypoperfusion will lead to renal failure. So this is the vicious circle of the Prash syndrome. So uh, remember, if uh, if you are facing a hyperkalemia with bradycardia, so this is a, a red flag for the Prash syndrome. Uh, one of the uh, interesting that uh, in ICU, you may have patient admitted to the ICU with community-acquired pneumonia, is febrile, 
is the respiratory distress, uh, heart uh, fever is 38 or 38.5-39, though the patient is bradycardic, so you should think about the differential diagnosis. So one of the uh, common causes of fever with bradycardia, which is the chlamydia and the legionella pneumonia. So think about when you are facing patient with uh, uh, community acquired pneumonia and he's bradycardic, put in your definition ethiopic pneumonia, which is chlamydia uh, or, or uh, legionella. Also the salmonella typhi, typhoid fever, porosella, when you have your patient is febrile and bradycardic, uh, put this is in your differential uh, diagnosis. Dengue fever also, uh, coxella, uh, diphtheria, those, one of the common uh, infections that uh, present with bradycardia, especially if the patient is febrile, so think or put it in your differential diagnosis because this is something unusual. If he's febrile, he should have tachycardia. But here, this infection is commonly associated with bradycardia. Uh, uh, despite the, the, the fever. So moving now to the third part in my uh, presentation, which is the approach and evaluation of bradyarrhythmia in the ICU. So now, for example, the, you have admitted this patient to the ICU in the morning because he was hypotensive and he's hypovolemic. Then you found his creatinine uh, was six and he has some metabolic acidosis then the nurse did the, as a routine uh, part, this is the ECG and they show it to you. So uh, when you go for the interpretation, the patient is bradycardic, heart little less than 50, there is no P wave, and something alarming here is big two wave. So big two wave, absent P wave, and bradycardia should raise the, the hyperkalemia uh, in, in differential diagnosis. Uh, and I told you, if the patient is shocked, now we are uh, playing with PRASH syndrome. Uh, so for the approach, start with physical exam, usually focus in on, on, on the adequacy of perfusion when you, you come bedside. So over to bradycardia shock patient, usually uh, uh, look for altered mental status. When you have occult bradycardia shock, the blood pressure, as I mentioned, and the mental status, cold extremities, poor urine output. So this is uh, giving you an idea about the adequacy of, perfu of perfusion uh, with bradycardia. Uh, when you go for uh, cardiopulmonary or cardiac uh, exam or cardiopulmonary exam, go for a point of care ultrasound, especially if the patient is shocked. And uh, uh, Dr. Walid also showed uh, nicely for us how to assess the volume status, how you look for uh, regional motion abnormality to answer yourself, is it MI or not? Especially if the, 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 the patient has uh, an inferior MI, regional motion abnormality, so this is uh, commonly related to right coronary occlusion and RV infarction, and AV nodal block or sinus node disease. Uh, also, uh, from point of care ultrasound, uh, if you look for the P line, so this is well I tell you this is a cardiogenic uh, in, in nature. Uh, also, in, in the neurological exam and the history of toxicology as well, it's very important when you have a bradycardia uh, and you are assessing patient in, in the ER or uh, in the ICU. So uh, also for neurological exam, as I told you, one of the uh, important issue uh, that will lead to bradycardia in, 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 in neuro ICU patients uh, or uh, trauma centers that you should look carefully how to assess the high ICP from uh, the clinical exam. Plus, if you have point of care ultrasound and you have uh, optic nerve, she's diameter. Uh, also, when you have patients with severe hepatic encephalopathy, uh, child seen, then the patient uh, admitted with hepatic coma, then before pushing and the patient is, is, is not improving, before uh, clinically wise, I mean, and he's bradycardic, potassium is okay, but before pushing the patient to the CT scan, just bring the probe, the ultrasound probe, and assess the optic nerve it will tell you about the optic nerve schist diameter if it's widened. So now it's reflecting the high ICP, the reason why the patient is bradycardic. 
Also examining the pinpoint propels, this is usually, uh, it, will, it will suggest for you, this is a, a, a toxic condition like uh, a cholinergic agent or for example, cholinidine as a drug toxicity. Uh, now you have to look for the EKG after you finish the exam. So when you look for the EKG, just I need from you three things you have to focus on. So please remember when you, 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 you have a patient in, in your ICU or in the ER and he's bradycardic and you order for a 12 lead ECG, please what I need from you is to focus on three, on the following three. Number one, you have to identify the rhythm uh, appropriately. Is this rhythm, is it sinus bradycardia? Is it junctional bradycardia? Sorry. Is it sinus bradycardia? Is it junctional bradycardia? Or it's a heart block? So rhythm diagnosis is mandatory uh, in your assessment. So you have to be familiar with rhythm identification. Number two, uh, look for signs of hyperkalemia. Absent P wave, big T wave. So uh, this is uh, the second uh, point you have to look for the ECG. And number three, look for signs of ischemia or STEMI. So for this example, this is an inferior STEMI with significant bradycardia here. So this is one of the common causes of sinus bradycardia or junctional bradycardia or even if a block. The second uh, tracing here, if you, you look for, here there is, is a sinus rhythm, there is a P wave, and the patient is bradycardic, but what this is remarkable here is the peak the T wave. The T wave is tall here. Peak T wave. Patient bradycardia ask about the serum potassium urgently. So v, v, venous blood gas or EBG before sending to the serum. Actually, so then you will find the patient or take the history, you will find it. Here also another, uh, 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 the third one, which is the type of the bradycardia here. Here, if you look carefully for the ECG, you will find here is a complete EV dissociation which is the AV block. So here, those three tracings will answer you uh, what uh, the rule of EKG. So uh, again, when you evaluate a patient with bradycardic, we're doing the ECG, focus on three. The rhythm, the signs of hyperkalemia, and the, uh, the, the evidence of uh, myocardial ischemia or infarction. Then moving to uh, number three in the evaluation part, which is the medication review. So please, when you admit patient to the ICU or you're evaluating him in the ICU, part of your assessment, the clinical, the uh, radiological, uh, the, the labs part is to has his medication list, which we call it medication reconciliation. So you have to ask about uh, recent medication changes and the dose titration. So, for example, if this patient on uh, uh, Dunizabel, which is the Aricept, uh, it's an as this is this medication. For example, we use it in Alzheimer patient. So, uh, if the patient uh, uh, is dementic at home, he he took a lot of bills of uh, the Aricept or the Dunizabel. So he present with severe bradycardia if you do not take a history for the family or it's one of his medication in, in, in your system, so you will miss it. Uh, be, why? Because this doni, uh, donibazal, it's uh, uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, centrally acting. So for drug toxicity, it will cause a bradycardia. Tizanadine, this is for muscle spasticity, and also it can cause bradycardia. Of course, in the ICU, we are using the Presidix or this, uh, dextamethamidine. We are using frequently. So uh, if you start the dextamethamidine and the patient became bradycardic, so think about the, the, the dextamethamidine. Uh, if you are using propofol with high dose and the patient start to have severe metabolic acidosis and bradycardia, so think about propofol infusion control. Even uh, patients who have glaucoma and they are coming with uh, eye drops for glaucoma, uh, for disembasomimetic properties, do, uh, eye drops, they may have reported cases that can cause predicardia, especially in the elderly people or patients with renal failure.
also uh, you should discuss with your clinical pharmacist about the drug drug interactions and uh, the, the the renally cleared uh, medications uh, with uh, AKI. So this is very important when you are doing a round uh, in your patients and he developed bradycardia. So this is one of the, the, the points that you have to address it and to uh, review it carefully. Uh, what about labs? Uh, frequently, you have to check uh, the finger stick if the patient uh, is having, uh, if you thought about hypoglycemia. Of course, the chemistry is, the, the, this is something routine, potassium and magnesium. Uh, troponin, if you are thinking about MI. Uh, the joxin level, if your patient is on, on the joxin for heart failure or orifab, so thinking about the joxin toxicity. Uh, if you are thinking about a patient having hypothyroidism or myxedema coma and bradycardic gland QT, hypothyroid, so think about the TS, uh, to, to request for CTH, CT, uh, TSH. If the patient, uh, you admitted him and you are uh, treating him as CAP uh, uh, and you, you will order for chlamydia serology, uh, especially if your patient is febrile and bradycardic. Also for Legionella, you will request for, of course, for your urinary antigen test. So this is will narrow your differential diagnosis when you, you face your patient's bradycardic uh, in the ICU. So, uh, and now moving for number five, which is the, the resuscitation of bradyarrhythmia. Now we finished with the evaluation, we finished with the workup, now, how to, to resuscitate your patient who is having malignant bradyarrhythmia? Uh, if you will ask me about the, 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 the proper terminology, uh, now the terminology is uh, changed uh, from, from before. Why? Because as I told you, if you for, for the bradycardia, uh, before we were uh, calling either symptomatic bradycardia or asymptomatic bradycardia, then arrest rhythm, which is pulseless rhythm or non-shockable uh, uh, rhythm. So here, uh, if you, for, for the bradycardia, uh, because our lecture today is about the malignant bradyarrhythmia or the bradyarrhythmia in the ICU. So uh, if you, you will leave the bradycardia uh, progress without intervention, so this is for, of course, it will lead to uh, the uh, asystolic or BEA uh, arrest. So better in your terminology, uh, you will have the symptomatic bradycardia, but we call it, uh, this is one type, uh, stable symptomatic bradycardia, because my intervention here is totally different. My assessment here is totally different. And it will uh, put the patient on a red flag that this patient, for example, if he's still stable, symptomatic bradycardia, he may, go into a window that we call it a bradycardic pre-arrest. So I should uh, prevent this before, or I, I, I pick up the patient here before he will go for the arrest. So better now to go for a new terminology, you call it stable symptomatic bradycardia, then bradycardic, whatever the bradycardia type, is there sinus or junctional, or is there AV block, than the arrest uh, uh, window. Those are the three common windows. And my intervention here is different than here, is different than here. So the, uh, the bradycardic pre-arrest may be loosely defined as severe bradycardia with shock state, okay? And the concern here is for imminent or immediate arrest. This is why we call it pre-arrest bradycardia or bradycardic pre-arrest. It warrants a maximally aggressive strategy or algorithm or intervention, which is designed to prevent the further deterioration into cardiac arrest. This is your aim. Of course, for the peri-arrest uh, bradycardia or bradycardic peri-arrest, there are two arms of therapy, either electrical or medical. It's hard to predict which patient will respond best to either of those two arms. It's very difficult from your practice. You, you start with medical, then the patient did not respond. You start with electrical, he respond or vice versa. So what's practically, practically or pragmatically to, you should do, especially for critical ill patient, you should proceed 
simultaneously, and this is my advice for fellows and residents in ICU, you should not wait for, uh, especially for the very arrest of bradycardia, you should not wait only for medical. So better to use simultaneously both arms of therapy as rapidly as possible until the patient is stabilized, then you will de-escalate. The same we will do with the antibiotics. You start the broad, then you de-escalate gradually. For patients with mild signs of organ hypoperfusion, like, as we mentioned, like normal blood pressure, but he had poor urine output. Now he had uh, a, a normal PP, but he had one of the signs of uh, hypoperfusion. Then more gradual and stepwise approach may be most appropriate, different than this pre-arrest. So this is, we call it uh, a pre-arrest uh, bradycardia approach. So here is the algorithm. It's a very simple algorithm for the, the peri-arrest or bradycardic peri-arrest. Uh, now the patient is uh, bradycardic, has a signs of high organ hypoperfusion, uh, and uh, uh, he is shocked. So uh, ideally, you should start simultaneously initiating uh, medical and electrical therapy. So here is the medical, uh, so here is the, the, the electrical, this arm is the, 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 the medical arm. Electrical arm, usually you start with TCP, but remember this TCP, which is the transcutaneous spacing, is a temporizing solution. It may fail, yes, it commonly fail. If it succeeds, yes, okay, go and uh, uh, stabilize your patient and uh, evaluate the reason or the etiology for bradycardia uh, and what the further treatment needed after that. Is it drug toxicity, is it MI? If the, the TCP or the transcutaneous spacing failed, so of course you have to uh, activate for uh, transvenous uh, basing. So this is the, the electrical arm, uh, includes the TCP, because the TCP usually is available in HICU, in the ER, uh, attached to your DC shock monitor, it's incorporated, so it's readily available. The problem with the TC, the, the transvenous, the, 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 the experience and the, the familiarity of people who can put it either bedside or in the cath lab. While the, 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 the medical arm, uh, usually epinephrine or atropine, usually uh, now the trend for the very arrest bradycardia, we prefer uh, using the epinephrine push doses, uh, but if the atropine is, is, is more readily available, give it without delay. Usually start with uh, one milligram, uh, the first dose. Uh, but remember, uh, uh, you should not give atropine for a cardiac transplant patient, and I will tell you later why. So we prefer for pre-arrest bradycardic patient with eminent pre-arrest, we should not use uh, uh, we do not use uh, atropine usually. We prefer epinephrine, I, and we'll tell you why we prefer epinephrine over atropine. The, if it feels, uh, think about calcium gluconate, and you should uh, think about other options in your, uh, uh, in your bucket if the calcium and epinephrine or atropine failed or TCP failed, think about the drug toxicity. So think about beta blocker toxicity. So you will give the antidote to the glucagon. If your patient having a local anesthesia, anesthetic toxicity, think about the interlabed emulsion, uh, uh, isoprenol or isoprel, isoprenol or isoprenol. So those are uh, their options uh, in your hand. Uh, again, if the patient uh, uh, responds well to your pharmacologic arm, then stabilize your patient and assess him for the next step for the reason or the cause of pradicar. Is it direct toxicity? Is it uh, myocardial ischemia? So or is it a renal failure? This is very important So uh, to manage uh, him and to save him before developing cardiac arrest. So again, to sum up uh, this algorithm, uh, for uh, very arrest uh, bradycardia, you should use simultaneously both the electrical arm and the medical arm. Uh, what about the atropine, which is traditionally, we, when we face patients with bradycardic, we are keep calling, give atropine. We are asking uh, to override and give me now an atropine. Open the crash card and give an atropine. Dr. Adil, if you don't mind, five minutes alert. Okay. So uh, the concern is about the atropine is 
at low doses, the atropine may cause paradoxical bradycardia. This is the very important. You have to take care about it. At low doses of atropine, it may cause paradox, paradoxical, uh, paradoxical bradycardia. It's only effective for bradycardia mediated by excessive vagal tone, of course. It will be uh, predictably fail to, in cases of high grade of a block. So you should not give uh, atropine for high grade of a block, third degree of a block, because the atropine will not act on uh, high grade of a block. It's contraindicated in heart transplant. Actually, uh, 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 the atropine will precipitate a systole, and there is the reported cases uh, receive the atropine uh, when they have a, a heart transplant and develop brady asystole. Atropine may stabilize the patient uh, shortly, 30 to 60 minutes, then it will wear off. It's short acting. So this makes the patient appear stable in front of you, but he will deteriorate uh, uh, later on. So this is uh, a many literature uh, reported about, uh, or case reports and uh, cohort studies also about the, the use of uh, low dose atropine for bradycardia in ICU, and it's complicated by uh, AV block or uh, severe bradycardia. Here for morbidly obese patients, here for the low dose of atropine in, in, in pediatric patients, it, there is a, a paradoxical uh, bradycardia that happened after the low dose of atropine. So uh, the usual uh, bradyarrhythmia that follow the low dose of atropine, which is 0 0.001 uh, per kg, is a sinus bradycardia. This is the commonest one. Usually it's caused by paradoxical slowing of the sinus node. The mechanism, why with the low dose of atropine, we have paradoxical bradycardia, not tachycardia, because the central vagotonic effect of the atropine, which is at higher doses, is masked by the uh, muscarinic blockade of sinus node. While the, the uh, as I told you, the atropine uh, is contraindicated in cardiac transplant patients, and the, the exact mechanism is, is unknown still, and it's under investigation, but they reported asystole uh, and sinus arrest or AV block. They found that in cardiac transplant patients, uh, the sinus node uh, response is abolished to atropine, while the AV node is, uh, response is exaggerated. So the patient will develop uh, AV block or asystole. So it's contraindicated uh, using the atropine and cardiac transplant patient. And this is one of the uh, board questions uh, uh, It comes in the MCQs. So uh, I just, and I will go just quickly because of uh, my time. Uh, what about using the epinephrine uh, for, uh, for bradycardia? Usually, uh, there is an, uh, many advantages for using epinephrine and bradyarrhythmia in, in ICU or very uh, arrest uh, 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 bradycardia uh, over uh, atropine. Usually, it's available everywhere, can be obtained quickly. Unlike the atropine, the epinephrine stimulates the entire myocardium. Epinephrine provides broader spectrum of efficacy for various mechanisms of bradycardia. I like to call it the epinephrine is the beptazo, or bepiracillin tazobactam of bradycardia. It treats the gram negative, the gram positive, the anaerobes. So the epinephrine is a wide spectrum. It's safe for epinephrine infusion uh, to use it in peripheral line. So either you boluses or, uh, or uh, infusion, just be ready what we call it dirty ibi drop so is there don't bother yourself with the im uh, which is one to one thousand or one uh, the iv form or the iv concentration one to ten thousand this is your concentration based on your concentration either you give it push here 20 ml or here you will uh, uh, go for infusion and this is one of the tricks when you 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 uh, you use epinephrine and you do not bother yourself which is uh, uh, this is the IMM uh, concentration well uh, this is the IV concentration take it and dilute it and this is the dilution and this is the, the diagram on how to use the infusion if you need to uh, continue with epinephrine infusion or to give repeated boluses or of epinephrine uh, what about calcium gluconate? Uh, yes, calcium gluconate is underestimated or underutilized in ICU patients for bradycardia. What about the indications usually in ICU? We call it calcium response to bradycardia. Uh, when uh, to give hyperkalemia, uh, sorry, to give calcium, usually with the hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, hypermagnesemia, calcium channel blocker, toxicity, and beta blocker occasionally. Uh, for dopamine, isoprenaline, I will not go through. 
for uh, uh, local anesthetic uh, toxicity or systemic toxicity. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the important and antidote that uh, when you face uh, a patient in an ICU who received local anesthetic uh, agent and he came to the ICU with bradycardic, then think about using the intralipid uh, emulsion. Beta blockade, calcium channel blockade uh, toxicity, you use high dose insulin, glucagon, uh, or interlipid uh, emulsions. Directical therapy, either transvenous spacer, this is the definitive one, or the, the TCP. The, the problem with the TCP or the transcutaneous spacing, uh, it, it's, it's uh, causing what we call it. Uh, my recommendation is the anterolateral approach, the usual way we use it because the air is a poor conductor of electricity. So placing the pads uh, over like the lung is a poor strategy. So what I prefer is to use anteroposterior, the same like this picture, anteroposterior, so that here the current go through the heart. This is will give you a better chance for capturing the heart. So this is how you lock for uh, uh, the ECG tracing for the TCP. So here, if you have the spike, usually it's broad and uh, opposite of polarity. So you will find the here the spike. Here is the complex spike, complex. So here is a persistent capture. Here is spike without capture. So you call it no capture or loss of capture. So you are keep increasing the amplitude until you get this tracing, which is the persistent capture. But the problem is not commonly affect, uh, uh, sorry, facing the heart. So you have to go with the, Trans, uh, venous spacing. The transvenous spacing uh, is, uh, though it's the most invasive strategy, but it's the most uh, successful intervention for treating your bradycardia for more than 95%. The indication usually for unstable bradycardia, which does not respond to other intervention, and symptomatic high grade uh, AV blood. Uh, just, I will not uh, go through. So, this is usually here is the, the, the tracing with persistent capture here, the patient with bradycardia, then here uh, with single chamber pacing, spike complex, spike, artificial spike, then QRS complex. Here is a dual chamber baser. Uh, this is, uh, before just I, I, I finish my talk, this is the tip for tonight. What's the tip for tonight? It's the difference between uh, PAA and pseudo PAA, pulseless electrical activity and pseudo uh, PAA. Uh, how you differentiate between uh, BA and the ECG and the echo, uh, BA or CDOA. So for uh, ECG, usually it's, it's narrow uh, if the uh, rhythm is narrow. So this is something mechanical. If the QRS complex is wide, this is metabolic. So this is when you face your patient having a PAA, look for the, uh, uh, the QRS complex. If the complex is narrow, so this is a mechanical cause, tamponade, pneumothorax, PE, if the, the QRS complex is wide, this is a hyperkalemia or severe metabolic acidosis. How you differentiate in uh, by point of care ultrasound during the PA, we have two rhythms. Either we call it PREM, this is pulseless uh, rhythm with rhythm echo motion. So this is, uh, it will help you to increase the pressure doses. Or we have another entity, we call it PRESS, this is pulseless only with the rhythm echo stand still. Here you will give the benefit. So this is really the PA, and this is really the pseudo PA. So uh, for take home messages, uh, and to sum up my presentation uh, tonight, uh, first do not assume that because of the blood pressure is normal, the patient is adequately perfusing and doing fine. Why? Because some patients, uh, the vasoconstrict and maintain normal blood pressure despite the organ hypoperfusion. For unstable uh, bradycardic patient, do not get fixed uh, on, on any specific intervention. Continue working through, as we mentioned, continue working through both electrical and medical therapy until something works. Do not rely only on, on single intervention. Do not be afraid to use uh, the push doses of epinephrine and uh, the peripheral uh, concentration or peripheral line for unstable bradycardic patient. Do not forget to get uh, a good medication history and do not be fooled with the TCP pseudo capture. Uh, remember that the bradycardia can be caused by MI and various intoxication. So fixing the heart rate may not be enough for uh, fixing your patient.
Zakla khair and thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Adil. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Unfortunately, we don't have time to ask. Sorry, attendees, we will try to ask to answer all your questions later. Um, uh, it has been like a very, very uh, informative, fruitful day. Thank you, Dr. Samir, for your lectures. Thank you, Dr. Walid, for your lecture. Thank you, Dr. Adil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Adil. <coughs> Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to have you all tonight. It is a very wealthy night for all scientific uh, event tonight and uh, very good success. Another uh, successful day in the MEGA online course and uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the, the wealthy three lectures that never happened before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.